the meeting, and uh, I think a lot of people have left. We have a concurrent session going on right now as well. Um, just to read your information, that uh, the proceedings of uh, uh, the symposium this afternoon will be published in the Canadian Journal of Population uh, Therapeutics and Clinical Pharmacology, and this um, afternoon session is being videotaped and audio taped, and it will appear on the uh, on the website. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's session on uh, clinically relevant pharmacokinetic changes in pregnancy. Uh, my name is David Nofford. I'm the president of, uh, of Pragmatic, and uh, it's a nonprofit group uh, organization that uh, advancing for the uh, safe and effective use of drugs in pregnancy. And uh, we need to also acknowledge the uh, support of Duchenne Pharmaceuticals, who've uh, supported this organization over the years, and, and they understand and, and support uh, this objective as well. So what I'd like to do is just give you a, a little bit of an introduction and uh, show you where uh, the organization, Pragmatic, is headed on what types of things we're doing and some of the issues that we're, that we're facing. And then we'll have our, our first speaker after that. So I'll just give you some background um, and the current situation in Canada regarding uh, drugs of pregnancy and lactation. Um, some of the things that are happening in other countries regarding legislation and labeling and the types of things that uh, we'd like to see happen uh, for Canada. So the mission of uh, Pragmatic is to advocate for the safe and effective use of medications in pregnancy and lactation. And that's pretty straightforward. And I think that, that everyone in, the, in this room is, uh, would, would, it, would agree with that, that mission. Our, one is to increase awareness of pregnancy issues at the government level through, through Health Canada. Another one is to require standard labeling of medicines for use in pregnancy and lactation. The third goal is to provide practitioners and patients access to current and reliable information for decision making when, when we're pregnant and lactating. Finally, advocate for the development of patient registries of surveillance programs for medications used during pregnancy and breastfeeding. I'll just quickly talk about some of the changes, pharmacokinetic changes in pregnancy, and you can see why that a lot of information needs to be developed, and, and some of our speakers will, will, will highlight some of these particular issues probably this afternoon. But there's certainly, we know that there's changes in total body weight and total body fat, uh, delayed gastric emptying and prolonged GI transit, which affect the bioavailability of drugs, an increased extracellular fluid and total body water, again, for drugs which are water-soluble can change the pharmacokinetics, for example, with the aminoglycosides. Increased cardiac output as a result of increased stroke volume and maternal heart rate, so again, this can increase uh, blood flow to the liver and to the kidney and increase clearance. And that's what I just, I just mentioned. And decreased albumin concentration with decreased protein binding. So some drugs which are highly bound, protein bound, the free part could be it could be increased and could have a therapeutic uh, therapeutic implications for that particular patient. And altered hepatic enzyme activity. So drugs which are metabolized by the CYP enzymes could be increased in terms of their metabolism. So there's lots of pharmacokinetic changes that are happening during pregnancy. Now some facts which. I indicated uh, on the top of it, odd but true facts. First of all, that most drugs, most drugs that we, w that we use in all, all our population are used in pregnancy and lactation to treat chronic or conditions that are induced during pregnancy. So high blood pressure, increased blood sugars, infection, common things that just don't stop because the woman's pregnant. Most of the drugs are used off-label very few drugs are studied for use during pregnancy and lactation. So most of the drugs are used, but very few drugs are studied. So there's little guidance, or minimal guidance, then to the physicians, the patients, the pharmacists, to advise on, on the safe use of these drugs during pregnancy. That, that's that's the, the basic dilemma of this, this whole situation. And most product monographs advise that drugs should not be used during pregnancy and, and breastfeeding. So 
a woman comes to you in, in, in her office and you need to look up something, a dose in the, in the CPS, it would say advise not to use in pregnancy and lactation. The woman needs the drug, so what type of situation are you put in? For reasons related to litigation, most pharmaceutical companies do not address the use, the, the use of drugs during pregnancy. And any information that we do have is usually obtained post-approval process in the phase four studies. So there are some, there are some pregnancy exposure, retrospective birth defect registries, but those are limited. And there's case series and case reports in, in the literature. But certainly the amount that's, that's being used out there, these, these types of reports are just a fraction of all the cases that in, in which the drugs are used during pregnancy and lactation. There's also a significant difference in the pharmacokinetics that exists between men and women, and especially women who are pregnant. But the bioequivalent studies include both men and women, and the results are based on an average of both genders. And there's no requirements, no requirements exist to disclose the exact population used in the bioequivalence trials. And generic drugs for this vulnerable population, it's just a pregnant woman, it may be approved based on results obtained using men in the trial. So I, all those pharmacokinetic changes that I alluded to earlier, sort of um, just ignored during the, during the studies for, the, for these, uh, these drugs. So the, the summation of all this is that the healthcare professionals are left with the burden of evaluating the risk benefit of using a medication during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So what is happening in other countries with this, with this dilemma? Well, in the United States, now this has been going on for a while, a long while, FDA requires labeling according to preset categories. And because of the studies, the limitation of the studies, most drugs are labeled as pregnancy category C. Human data is lacking animal studies positive or not done. So the majority of drugs in that fall into that category, and, and actually that, that's not very helpful. When you look in there, you're, you're basically at the same situation. Um, and some of the drugs, very few, are in category A, or some in category B, and we know that, that there are some drugs that are contraindicated. Um, but the majority of drugs are in category C. And a number of years ago when I was looking at this and uh, looking at the situation in um, one of the northern European countries, with Finland or um, Sweden, if they had a different, they have a different category uh, situation over there, and a lot of the drugs that would have been category C in the United States would have fit into a different category over there, where the woman or the physicians would have more um, assurance about using the drugs and not using the drug. So that's the situation uh, as it exists in the United States. And we tend to use this, uh, we took up Briggs, we, we get these uh, categories. But again, category C, it, it doesn't really help us. In 2008, the FDA had proposed to amend the labeling regulations and it, to pregnancy information would be moved in from the contraindication section to the section use in specific populations. And then the prescription drug label would require pregnancy exposure registration if that was applicable and if we had that information. A general statement about the background risk of fetal developmental abnormalities, clinical considerations, and the data components. So there's more information to help the prescriber. Um, about a year and a half ago, at the end of 2009, the FDA announced collaboration with researchers in and, and, and a medication exposure and pregnancy risk evaluation program. And I, this has started and the data from this will be used in 11 uh, health pl uh, plan affiliated research sites in the United States. So we're waiting to hear what's going to, what the results of that are gonna be and then they will get back to the FDA and then we will see. That's what's going on uh, presently in the United States. Europe is, uh, is a couple of steps ahead of us and a couple of steps ahead of what's going on in the United States. The European Medicines Agency Evaluation, EMA, um, has guidelines on the exposure of, to medicinal products during pregnancy, the need for post-authorization data. 
a guideline on risk assessment of medicinal products on human re reproduction and lactation from data to labeling. This was effective January 2009. That's uh, over two years old now. So <clears throat> this is an example of the statements for use in the pregnancy section of the monograph. So based on human experience, that would be indicated the drug is uh, suspected to cause congenital malformation when administered during pregnancy, or the drug X should not be used during pregnancy unless the clinical condition of the woman requires treatment. A modern amount of data on pregnant women uh, indicate no mal malformative or fetal toxicity, uh, finding no effect during pregnancy or anticipated since systemic exposure to drug X is negligible. So this, this scheme provides some more guidance for, for clinicians to prescribe. Coming back to uh, Canada, it's something that maybe some of you know more about. I just heard about this uh, last week in London when um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gray was speaking about uh, the Drug Safety and Effectiveness Network, which um, was sort of an offshoot of Bill C-51 that, that was, was not passed um, in, the, in the government and it's been dropped and apparently the government has no more interest in that, but the money that was going to go towards that is now um, that, that funding has gone to CIHR, and um, I guess that they will be um, calling for uh, groups to apply uh, for funding. And certainly, um, pregnancy and lactation would, would fall under the Drug Safety and Effective Effectiveness Network. So that may be uh, one possibility uh, for a unified approach across the country. Some of the things that uh, Pragmatic uh, has as priorities um, are listed here, and one is the draft guidelines for inclusion of pregnant women in pharmacokinetic studies, and this was presented to Health Canada almost two years ago. Uh, we're advocating for the adoption of the European labeling requirements for pregnancy and lactation, like they have in Europe by Health Canada, a request for creation of registries for women who need to take drugs during pregnancy and post-market surveillance studies, and ensure that drugs indicated for women are studied in women. Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, the end of the, the, the introduction part and just give you some background on Pragmatic and uh, some of the uh, goals and priorities and what's happened, happening uh, in the United States and what's happening in Europe and hopefully where things will be happening in, in Canada and there may be some opportunities through the uh, drug safety and effectiveness network for some uh, collaborative research across the country.